Okay, good evening. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. And I'd just like to say a very warm welcome from the University of Manchester to everyone who's joining us in the room. Uh, firstly, to our speakers. Um, mm -hmm. They will introduce themselves in a moment, so I, I won't preempt that. And thank you very much to everyone who's joining us in the room uh, and online at home through Facebook Live. This is the first time we've done a, uh, a live webcast through, uh, through Facebook Live, but we thought, we thought we'd heard about Facebook. We thought we should maybe give it a go. It seems to be quite popular, so um, we thought as we're doing digital disruption, we'd, we'd, we'd try that out. So um, firstly, I've just got a couple of uh, housekeeping notices. So uh, the toilets for gents are on this floor down that way, and for uh, ladies just upstairs on the fourth floor, there's a lift uh, down this end. There's no scheduled uh, fire alarms, so if you do hear one, uh, please just make your way downstairs, uh, out onto the Hallam Street exit, and there's a muster point just down the road, uh, and you'll be guided there. Um, so why are we doing these events? Uh, the primary purpose of them is to uh, bring alumni together in London. It's a huge constituency of alumni. There's uh, over 24,000 uh, Manchester graduates uh, just in this city. It's the largest group outside of Manchester. So these are an opportunity to, um, some of our events are for you to learn about research going on at the university. These are primarily about networking, allowing you to connect with each other and also listen to uh, speakers drawn from the uh, alumni network to talk about big challenges that, that uh, face us in our professional lives. Uh, so we've covered um, the post-Brexit reality in the autumn. We uh, did the future of the NHS a couple of months ago. In two months' time, we'll be talking about 21st century leadership. Um, but tonight is about, uh, is about digital disruption. Um, so we've, uh, we've got a, a great panel uh, for you. And we're, we're really excited to, uh, to invite them here to, uh, to take your questions. Uh, we also invite questions from the online audience at home. Uh, we've got someone monitoring the, uh, the live feed and any, any questions you submit. Uh, through the live feed or through Twitter or through whoever, wh whichever uh, means you choose, um, you will get the opportunity to... Um, I'm getting stared at by Helen. I think that just, just, through, just through Facebook Live, just do that. Um, I don't want to confuse things. Um, yeah, so finally, uh, slightly peculiar uh, blue cuboid in my hands. Uh, this is something we've been trying for the last year. Uh, it's called a catch box, and it's a throwable microphone. Um, there is a practical purpose for it, which is that in a room like this, it's inevitably difficult and slow to pass a roving mic from person to person. We want the maximum amount of time for Q&A and discussion, so I will shut up in a moment. Um, but to speed that up, and to also add a bit of energy and a bit of, a bit of uh, you know, fun, we're going to ask you to throw this microphone. It is very safe to do that. Uh, it cuts out when it's being thrown, so it doesn't get any nasty distortion. And I promise you, it is very, very difficult to injure someone with this <laughs> throwable mic. We, we've had almost no serious injuries with this, with this microphone. All, almost, almost a clean slate, really. So um, basically, when you want to take uh, a question, when you want to give a question, uh, just raise your hand, and it will be the job of the person who's holding it, a bit like a character in Lord of the Flies, to pass on the conch or the microphone uh, by throwing it. Please give the person who wants it a fighting chance of catching it. This isn't your opportunity to fulfill your dreams as a uh, test cricket bowler um, or a baseball player, whatever you sport it. Um, so, so that's it. So we're going to hear from the panel um, to set the scene, and then... Very shortly after that, we're going to go straight into Q&A. And, and really, this is, about, this is about an interaction between uh, you, the panel, and, and the online audience. So please do make the most of that. Thank you. Marcus. I think, we can, I think you can get a clap from that. Um, so nice to see some familiar faces. Nice to see some unfamiliar faces. I hope none of you leave with concussion and never come again. Um, this is digital disruption. That doesn't mean that you get to automatically be disruptive. 
but we will encourage a certain amount of it. Um, also, in the spirit of digital disruption, we have decided that we are going to do some standing and some sitting because of the shape of the room. When we're sat down talking, we thought some of you might struggle to see us. So this isn't musical chairs, musical bumps happening at the front if we're going up and down. And equally, it's not us trying to be sort of make some political point about informality. It's, it's just a feature of the space. So, as Marcus said, tonight we are talking about digital disruption and we have a fascinating panel. And what we're going to do is ask them to introduce themselves and some initial thoughts on the, on the topic and then we will open the floor with the cash box. The catch box. It's hard to say. Hey, conch is better. So, here for it is known as the conch. If we can pass the conch around, that would be great. Um, so, if we can start with Shane at the end. Hi everyone, I'm Shane. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of a company called Taylor & Hart. We're an online jeweller and we're focused on trying to make custom design and accessible music. So, I guess I wanted to share with you this evening uh, how we've been trying to create a way to make uh, high-touch um, physical retail and into a scalable digital composition. So, when we started our business, uh, we were a touchless e-commerce browse our site, add to cart, check out, and we, we were really struggling to differentiate in this market. Um, it's a very competitive space, and what we were finding was that uh, some customers would be reaching out to us, talking to us, and asking us if we could help them to uh, help them find an engaged rate or find a, a dime to sort of move away from the touch uh, part of the e-commerce process. And we decided to give it a go. So we tried it for a year, and we came to the conclusion that no one's doing it online because it's really difficult. Um, when you're dealing with a custom, custom uh, design customer, they're looking for a level of service and quality. Um, uh, they're looking for uh, really high manufacturing quality, expert advice. They want them to create something that's really, really personal to them. And it's something that's quite difficult to do uh, in a cost-effective manner. It, it's, it's quite challenging. So, we decided that we would give it a go and we would try and bring people in for consultations. So we went back from the whole way from e-commerce back to now being, uh, having a physical element of business. So we could bring people in and we would uh, have our designers design, uh, sketch out designs for their products and uh, we would uh, help them talk about the uh, designs that are available for them their budget. And, um, and it worked really well. We ended up having 85% conversion using this process. But the problem was that it's not scalable. Um, you, can only, you can only provide this service to your local market. Um, and we knew that there was a lot of demand in the US. So we needed to find a, a, a way to make this process work online. So we did a couple of things. The first thing that we tried to do was to uh, create a way that we could replicate this design process online. So we used. Uh, we outsource designers to offer every single customer a free design before uh, they've checked out at all. So this meant that uh, we would get a chance to engage our customers and sort of work with them to design something that's completely unique and then they can't compare with our competitors. We also realized that uh, no one seems to actually enjoy communicating by email. So we focused on making our entire sales and design process completely mobile responsive and invite the customers WhatsApp and have consultations uh, using video conferencing and Skype and through these sort of uh, chat channels. And it's got a completely different dynamic to it. People are far more relaxed and a better free flow of ideas. So that worked quite well for us. And then we also were trying to find a way to overcome um, this uh, sort of di diamonds are quite a commoditized product. So we focused on making sure that all the ones we were selling had. Uh, pictures and videos of the, of the stone because we were finding people getting very excited about the idea that this is the specific stone that I'm looking at in a video that's going to be set into my ring. And it allowed them to create a connection across distance with a product that they've never seen before. Uh, the other thing we were looking at is sending people samples. And this worked quite well because people were able to touch and feel the product. Um, but the uptake for this process was quite low. Conversion was very high when they did ask for it, but it tended to extend the sales cycle, and it meant that uh, people who came in with a very tight deadline 
uh, it just wasn't convenient for. So we had to come up with a way to make samples digital. So what we did is instead of sending our free uh, design as an image to the customers, we developed a way to send it as a 3D browser-based render that people can open up on a mobile device or any kind of device. It allows them to look at a product, a real, photorealistic model of a product, from all the different angles without having to, um, without having to touch anything physical. And it allows people to overcome the, the distance again between e-commerce and seeing something in the store. So these are just a few of the things that we've been doing to try and uh, make e-commerce a bit more realistic and a bit more natural. And I think what I'm trying to say in a, in a broader sense is that people did, have never stopped wanting these things. We just stopped offering it to them. And I think there's going to be a lot of development in the next couple of years on how online businesses can find ways to bridge this gap in a cost-effective manner that doesn't stop them being this, uh, this scalable e-commerce business. Anything that means less email gets my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, lifetime sound. <laughs> but I think the thing about seeing things in 3D is interesting. I remember when I was choosing um, both my engagement ring and another ring that I bought, I wanted to know how it's going to look on the keyboard, because that's mostly where I see my hands. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't remotely interested in showing it to other people. That was going to be my view of it, so that's how I wanted it to look. The jeweler thought I was barking mad, but yeah, you know, it, so he left happy. Um, that's it. Right. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Vasil Sardalias and I lead the software development team at TPL. Um, TPL is the company that licenses public performance of music, and manages copyright and dis distributes that copyright um, revenue back to the musicians and all the performers uh, around UK. And I'm here to talk to you today about digital disruption in the music industry. Um, obviously, most of the um, most of the terms that we're going to use today around music are maybe familiar to you, things like online streaming. Um, actually, yeah, who here doesn't have a Spotify account? <laughs> right? Yeah? Um, yeah, for the, for the audience that can't see on Facebook, I'd say that was about <laughs> two thirds. Yeah? Yeah. All right, so things like Spotify, where songs are, are streamed online instantly to your device. Um, things like musical composition and how is that now being affected by technology. Um, things like data and artificial intelligence, because the whole business of PPL is heavily data dependent. We need to have good data about all the songs and all the albums and all the artistic creations that happen around this in order to distribute the revenue properly to the people that deserve it. And that's a very crucial part of our business. Finally, what excites me most is to talk about artificial intelligence and how that flows and interrupts the whole music industry altogether from, from the very, very, very basic, which is the conception of an idea. Um, right now, there is um, services like Flow Composer online. Um, I don't suppose many of you must have heard it, but it's, it's, it's a service that offers creation of music automatically by the computer for whatever purpose you want it to. If you want to create an ad, if you want to create a jingle, if you want to put something on the background of an image and upload it on YouTube, there is a service that does that for you. You don't need to uh, to pick a composer uh, to do that. And all these things, they create the additional sort of challenges around the world about how do we how do we deal with licensing? How do we license that kind of content? It's automatically generated. Nobody actually spent any thought around. Um, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't spend any uh, effort to actually compose it, put it on the, on the computer or something like that. And these are, these are really important challenges that we're going to face in the next uh, decade or so, um, if I may say so. And um, yeah, that's just about it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if anyone wants to come up with a, a longer jingle, those of you watching online, uh, we don't have one. Um, I'm sure Marcus will be very pleased to receive them in his inbox via email. <laughs> Hi everybody, so my name is Arabelle Bailey um, and I lead Accenture Digital, which is the digital arm, obviously, um, of Accenture um, in the UK and Ireland. Um, and I, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about digital just in the context of our clients and some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, so I've worked for Accenture, it's now coming up for 26 years. Um, and if I include the time I spent um, doing IT work at university as well, I've probably been in and around the IT space for about the last 30 years. 
Um, and in that time, you know, I've seen a number of different waves of technology. So, you know, when I started, it was all on the mainframe. Um, my first project in Accenture was coding in COBOL, a power station uh, work management system uh, on a green screen, very glamorous. Um, and I remember the big change that came in around the time of client server and all the debates about this huge processing power that people were going to have on their desktops or laptops. Um, and then maybe five, ten years later when the internet really started to come to the fore and, you know, all these exciting new business models that that would enable. Um, and if I think about the first maybe 15 to 20 years of my career, those were the three main big technology waves that happened over that period. So plenty of time for our clients to kind of think about what they wanted to do with those, how they could get value from them, and plenty of time for us to think about how we could help them implement them. If you think about where we are now and what we've seen over the last sort of five to eight years, I guess, is just this massive explosion of lots and lots of different technology waves all coming in rapid succession and all maturing incredibly quickly. Um, so if you think about smartphone technology, I imagine everybody in the room um, has a smartphone. Um, if you think about the impact of social media and how we create social networks and how we communicate with each other and pass around information. Um, if you think about the advent of the cloud and just the huge sort of processing power um, and flexibility that that gives large businesses in terms of things that they might want to do. Um, if you think about software as a service business models, it just completely change the way we license um, different types of software. Um, if you think about big data technologies um, and how we can start to collate and make sense <clears throat> of the huge data footprint or data exhaust that we leave behind as we start living our lives through our smartphones and leaving a sort of digital footprint behind. Um, if you think about artificial intelligence, I mean, that's not new. It's been around for decades. But now we finally have the processing power to really use artificial intelligence to do all the sorts of interesting things that have been in people's minds um, for, for a long time. If you think about drones, if you think about 3D printing, if you think about blockchain, if you think about autonomous vehicles, you know, all of these things are coming and hitting our clients all at the same time. And that's having a massive impact on how they think about what they do currently, how they think about what markets they might want to go into in the future, and in fact, just what their business um, is currently about. And so that's my job. It's why I think I've got partly the best job in Accenture um, in UKI, because it's, it's never been a more exciting time to be in this world of technology, but also partly why I've got the most difficult job in Accenture, because trying to keep up with all of that and trying to help our clients think about how they can maximize the use of all of that technology that's coming on stream at the same time to really survive and thrive um, in this new world is, is part of what I do every day. So that's my introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Nick. Hi. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Nick Feingold. And um, what I do is I try to solve all the problems that you have. <laughs> um, and I'm desperately going to try and flog what we do to you <laughs> yeah, bef really before you go. Well, you've already got it in your phone. But, um, but, but basically, you know, disruption is a really interesting thing. My background actually wasn't, wasn't in consulting. My, I had my own stockbroking business in, in Brick Lane, and we got up to about 100 million of revenues and, and 250 people. And I've actually run a business is, is, is really the point of that story. It is, I've run a business, I've bought a business, I've sold businesses, you know. And a lot of, a lot of the theory and the hype around disruption and digital and, and things are, are, um, are very confusing for most people. So what we'll try and do, uh, I hope today, is just give you a few sort of simple, simple rules to help you follow it. So we try to follow the 20 most disruptive trends in the world. We use a combination of uh, search algorithms and Boolean search queries to do that. Uh, Boolean search query sounds really complicated, but it's actually really simple. It's like when you say oh, Chelsea, you get Chelsea articles, um, but you have to screen out Chelsea Clinton because you don't really want that. Um, and we can talk about how these, these algorithms are quite prejudicial, right? which is what a lot of companies do is they've been taught to specialize in one particular area. But I know from sitting in front of screens for, for 30 years that 50% of everything bad that happened in my life um, was not something that I was looking at. Best example I can think of is no one was looking at subprime lending before 2008. Um, so we screen for all these peripheral risks uh, for companies, and we try to bring some order to, to, to what is a mad world. And, and the three basic rules that, that we use is that disruption, um, digital or otherwise, um, takes place by something what, which we call velocity, right? which is that 
One of our clients is British Petroleum. Um, and I sort of, this, uh, people are aware of fracking, presumably. Well, fracking wasn't a secret. In fact, in President Obama's first term, he stood up and he basically said, I want to back the fracking industry and I want America to be energy independent. And every oil major heard that, every consultant heard that, every analyst heard that. And yet seven years later, the oil price went from $130 to $30. And as a stockbroker, I was kind of used to getting one right and one wrong. But when everybody gets something wrong or everybody gets something right, it really pricks my interest. And I'm like, how could everybody get this so diabolically wrong? In BP's case, they had to write down and depreciate their assets by, by $10 billion. Now, they're still around but they will pay us quite a lot of money to watch velocity. So when the speed of a known trend, and I would argue that most of the people in the room know about most of the trends, um, when the speed of a known trend goes far faster than you think or far slower than you think, that can cause massive disruption. So that's the first way that you, you start to see disruption. The second way you start to see disruption is what we call a peripheral risk becoming a core risk. And we've all lived these examples, which is Nokia has, had 35% market share. It was about, I think, a 200 billion market cap. You know, the iPod was invented. They went, we don't care. They make music. We make phones, <laughs> right? And so by the time the peripheral risk or the iPod becomes the iPhone, the company never recovered. Neither did Ericsson, neither did BlackBerry. Three of the world's biggest phone companies wiped off the face of the earth by one invention, which was a peripheral risk becoming a core risk. And then the third and final way that, that the disruption really takes place is what I call combination punches. And again, we're all pretty familiar um, with combination punches, which is that if you join up different existing technologies, you can very, very sharply increase the velocity um, of the trend. So mobile phones existed, cars existed, Google Maps existed, and booking apps existed. But it wasn't until you joined the four of them up, called it Uber, that you had a $60 billion company in two years. So there was this explosive hockey stick trajectory as a result of combination punches. So um, I think that's probably enough. I'm happy to discuss almost any trend in almost any market. I, I'd love to talk about stuff as, you know, you can talk digital health. And I'll talk to you about why I think that maybe later on, if someone wants to ask why I think bicycles might be the biggest trend in the world that I see <laughs> right now, uh, if anybody's interested. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, panel. <laughs> so I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that we have uh, pretty much every angle of digital and technology covered and I think probably everybody would agree that digital and tech are the same thing because I think we're creating this artificial gap between them. Digital's this kind of weird thing. Now, I'm going to get this out of the way now because I have been threatening to the panel all afternoon that I'm going to talk about David Hasselhoff. And if I don't get on and do it, it's going to sit like a demon on my shoulder. So I just want to tell you why I want to talk about David Hasselhoff and why digital disruption now makes me think of David Hasselhoff because then I'll have it off my chest. Is that all right? <laughs> okay, right. Does everybody know who David Hasselhoff is? <laughs> The Hoff. The Hoff. Famous for wearing red shorts, running around with Pamela Anderson, and being Knight Rider. Yeah? Get his fame. Well, uh, University of Manchester alum. Yeah, wearable technology was already happening back then. Um, another Manchester alum who's a friend of mine um, has written a short film which stars David Hasselhoff. But when I say he has written it, he wrote it along with an artificial intelligence called Benjamin. So AI has been responsible for the script of two films. Um, if you Google Hasselhoff and AI, it will take you there. Um, Oscar Sharp is the director. So for me, that was kind of a genuine clash. So then you talking about people wanting to go back to the familiar, the things that they know. I mean, Hasselhoff is quite wrinkly, but he's still wearing the red shorts in the film. <laughs> I'm slightly worried that he's never taken them off. Um, and then you're talking about the licensing and that creative impulse. How do we still monetize that so that people have access to that as a, an income stream? You're looking at it at scale. And how does a business where there's an app for that find their place in the market? And then you're looking at an even that's bigger that's scale. Really <laughs> <laughs> then, then that's fine. That's fine. And I think we all are. So... Um, 
we're not setting a framework around this. The, the questions and where it goes, whether it's about Hasselhoff, I'm not an expert on the Hoff, but I haven't Ace now talked about it, so I feel happy. Um, so, Marcus, if you have the microphone, who would like to be our first question? Okay, at the back. Are you ready? <coughs> Bravo! Because <laughs> I'm so far back. <laughs> Um, that was lucky. That was heading for my face. <laughs> but Evening, it wouldn't everyone. hurt you. I promise it wouldn't hurt you. Evening, I'm Ravin. Um, thank you for the talk so far. Very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask about social responsibility because the speed at which technology is moving, governments do not move at that speed. So, for example, Uber comes along and you've got a whole load of people whose uh, livelihoods depend on earning a living a certain way, tax, black taxi drivers, for example. They've invested a lot of their time and money into getting there, and then they can be wiped out. So in every industry we look at, technology is coming in. Governments really, I don't see, are capable of protecting, uh, whether they need protecting or not is another matter, but, I mean, the disruption is so huge that there's a massive danger that uh, wealth is concentrated with a few people and a lot of people are disenfranchised. I think some of that we've seen because of Brexit. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on that and if you guys have experienced or seen anyone doing anything that uh, actually is positive and can keep up um, with the speed of technology much faster than governments can. I don't think with Uber that's going to become even more pertinent. Today they're talking about the fact they're inventing cars that will take off and fly, and they think they'll have those to market in 2022. So how aviation is going to catch up with that. Um, do you want to start with that? And yeah, you're, either of you. There's quite a few things there. Yeah. There are quite a few things there. I mean, it, it's certainly something that... I'm, sorry, I'm sure. <laughs> um, it's certainly something that all of our clients are very aware of, and particularly in the area of artificial intelligence and a lot of uh, technologies like robotic process automation, which have the possibility to take huge cost out of businesses, but also have the possibility of, of you know, taking huge numbers of jobs out of businesses. Um, and it's certainly something that our clients are very aware of in terms of approaching particularly artificial intelligence in a very responsible way. I don't think anybody has all the answers, to be perfectly honest, because this stuff is moving so fast. Um, but what we are seeing is you know, hesitation around doing all the things that they could do now in order to, to really get some of that stuff right. Um, I can tell you an Accenture example, because we obviously have you know, a big offshore um, set of centres. We do a lot of BPO, or business process outsourcing work, mm -hmm. offshore. Um, and we've been rotating our own business to a lot of these new technologies. Um, and actually, our focus very much has been on how do you, free, how do you use these technologies to free up humans to do more value-added work. Um, so we've taken, we've implemented some of these technologies that have taken, I think the number is 30,000 jobs out of some of our offshore centres, but no one has actually lost their job. All we've done is redefine what those people do. So, you know, they've still got a livelihood, we can feel good about that, but actually the work they do is work that we need humans to do. It's not the boring stuff that is repeatable that can be automated. It's the stuff that's much more interesting. And so I think we'll see that as a real trend in terms of you know, actually people looking after their employees and thinking about how you retrain, upskill, etc. So, I mean, that's just a, a particular Accenture example. Right. Can I have a little crack at that as well? Um, firstly, shamelessly, if you go to curationcorp.com and you hit ESG... You, we follow environment, social responsibility, and corporate governance. You'll get you'll get a list of things that are happening in the in in, in that space. Um, and if you're ever asked, uh, just say you're Manchester University, and you'll never be charged. So uh, anyone anyone wants to follow the trends that we're talking about ongoing, and we're, we're trying to make it effortless for people to do that. I mean, if we just use a, a couple of examples, um, because actually, I, I don't see. Let's use an example in our lifetime. Uh, cash machines and online banking. Again, backpedal 15 or 20 years. You know, the cash machine comes in, people, the tellers are going. Um, I remember Egg. Does anyone remember Egg Bank, online banking? You know, that doesn't exist anymore. That was going to wipe out NatWest, Barclays. And what happens is the technology becomes integrated into a suite. And, and the really weird thing, and this is the beautiful thing, which I think should give everybody a bit of comfort, when I go to my flat in London and I go and Fulham Broadway, the bank that's absolutely smashing it is Metro. 
bank that's got six human beings standing in the lobby that will face-to-face -face interact with you in a digital world. And so the, the, the sort of super trend is actually, um, yes, the uh, checkout might go, but there'll be 15 people in the supermarket giving you food tastings. It will be a kinder, nicer experience. Yes, you know, we'll use digital banking, but it'll be a kinder, nicer I experience. And um, just on the point of autonomous cars, um, I'd like you to think about this. You can kind of take off and land a plane fully automatically already, but i um, pretty sure there's a pilot for the purpose of manual override. So um, when they mow down people on Westminster Bridge in a car which has been weaponized, think about hacking a fleet of cars. Think about putting a bomb in an autonomous car and sending it to an address. Um, there are lots of these sort of things that happen on the periphery, which actually velocity will slow down a trend. So it's clear that the technology can provide fully autonomous cars tomorrow, but there are things that we look at and study that says, well, hold on a second. <laughs> we can fly a plane fully automated today, but there's still a pilot. And with terrorism and cyber risk and 360,000 attacks a day, do I, as the government of the country, feel confident that without serious testing and without serious satellite um, cyber security that, that I'm going to allow my entire fleet of cars <coughs> to be weaponized? So there are lots of these things. It's a great question. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, so just wanted to touch on your point about governments, though, because that was, um, I mean, from, from my perspective, there is a few things that governments have done. They've been slow in responding. Um, only, only, only last year, I think, governments issued the Open APIs Act for, for banks to open their APIs to the outside world. You will be looking at digital banks fully online very, very soon, I presume, unless there Can is a proper... Just API. Yeah, yeah. Define it for the audience. All right, sorry. Uh, so it's basically um, an interface to the intranet of banks, to the core system of banks. So when you make a transaction, you go through a bunch of systems. Yeah, but you can access it now from the outside world. So you, don't, you no longer have to be on the online channel of a bank in order to access its internal services. Yeah, they will offer it to the outside world, and God knows what kind of industry will that create. But at least there is a framework, and it was only introduced by the government very recently. I think it was last year. Similarly, there is Copyrights and Data Protection Acts that have been introduced in the past. Yeah, but right now, not all of this framework is applicable to the likes of Spotify or YouTube or iTunes or um, any other streaming service, you, you name it. And that's, that shows that there is a response, but it's just been slower than you would expect. So there is reaction, but it's slower than you would expect. And that's only because governments, pretty much like every other big corporation in the world, are slow in adapting to change. Yeah, that was it. Yes. So obviously you were talking about social responsibility and how governments maybe are trying to achieve something, but maybe don't have the tools to achieve that at the correct speed. So one thing that uh, people were trying to deal with for a long time was, in our industry, conflict diamonds. And it's applicable in many different industries where you're trying to uh, get a supply chain and ensure that the transmission of the goods through every single level is completely legitimate and there's all sorts of opportunities for fraud and smuggling and all of this kind of thing. But obviously with the introduction of the blockchain, we're getting to the situation where, well, there's one company we're particularly working with, uh, Everledger, who are introducing the uh, like um, imprinting of each diamond into the blockchain as it goes through each level of the supply. You can then be able to trace back it to its point of origin. Again, for those who are perhaps outside of the world, blockchain. Um, hmm. Uh, how would you describe it? <laughs> uh, I didn't say I was going to make it so easy, it's a, but I am um, trying to be the voice of the layperson. It's a, a ledger where, trying to in a simple way, uh, you put in a transaction and then a series of, it basically is Im impossible to, uh, to um, have a fraudulent transaction within this sequence of transactions. So you, you effectively have a, a record of everything that's ever been put into the blockchain previously. So it provides uh, an audit trail for, for anything, really. Um, so yes, there's, there's, the, there's technology coming that will allow governments to um, achieve these quite difficult policing goals, for example, in what is quite an elegant solution. Yeah. OK, interesting, with all of the concomitant problems that policing and tracking and big data, you know, the, the data that's then held about all of those items in the blockchain is, is quite something. Um, Ravi, I think, don't think you have to throw it very far. <laughs>
Do I need to hold this a certain way? Yes, OK. Um, yeah, I think... You know, I've, I've worked in the public sector a lot and, and more recently in the private sector, and one of the features of the public sector has already been mentioned is, uh, is uh, uh, certain things working against change. And I think one of the questions I was keen to explore this evening uh, is I'm constantly struck by all the positive talk about di digital developments, and that, that's why we're here tonight, um, but we're also aware of cyber risk and so forth. Though in the... In the worlds that I've been in, you know, one of the big things is money. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of positive ideas about around, but, you know, if you're going to buy a kit, you need money, you need the will, and so forth. So what I was really interested also to discuss is, in reality, uh, what, what have been the barriers to organisations actually putting out, basically, to, to invest in these kind of things, and how, how do those barriers actually get overcome? Interesting. I think some of the people that I know would say it's all the fault of every CTO that's currently in post and then the next generation will make it much better. But then I seem to have been hearing that for as long as I've been aware of people talking about business. So um, I think in terms of how you get big businesses to respond faster and invest in technology, that's conversations yeah, yeah. you must be having regularly. I mean, is that the question? Just how do you persuade yes, big I mean, businesses I, to invest in Yes, and I, I think also, uh, from my experience, you know, organisations will in, invest in, in new ideas for a variety of reasons. It may be for a reason of competitiveness, but it may not. It may be just to be on trend. It may be because, oh dear, we've had a problem, we need to do something about it. So there are all sorts of other reasons, apart from the obvious, you know, it's a, you know, it's a good thing and we, you know, would help us. Yeah. yeah. So those it, are the realities. Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, it's a big question. Um, I guess, you know, I mean, one observation I have, I've been in this role now for three years, and, you know, we have moved in that time very much from talking to clients about why they need to do something into a whole phase where we were talking about what they needed to do, which we're still talking to them about, but then really now we're in the how. You know, how do you, if you're a big traditional business that's worked in a particular way for decades, how do you embrace some of these new technologies? And, and there's all sorts of barriers to doing that. So one is certainly investment, because you know, these are big, big amounts of money that these big businesses are going to have to spend. Another big one, actually, is cultural, and just how you shift your organization in the way that they've thought, you know, relatively similarly for, for decades. How do you shift the ethos of that company to be a little bit more experimental. You know, I talked about all these waves of technology that are all coming at the same time. You know, what that means is no one really knows what the right answer is. You know, you can have a strategy and you can think of, you know, you know which direction that you're going in, um, but actually you don't really know what the end point is going to be because new technology is coming online all the time and maturing and can be incorporated. Um, so we talk to clients a lot about a kind of four-stage plan in terms of what they ought to do. So the first is just to really invest in the core of their business. So, you know, whatever it is they do, think about doing that in a more cost-effective and efficient way to free up investment capital. Then think about scaling the core. So how do you do more of that, again, to bring in more revenue that you can invest in than you? Um, thirdly, then, is to really think about what is the new that these businesses want to be in. You know, how do they need to react to all the competitive pressures that are around them? And then the fourth one is just to really think about what's the right balance of investing in what we do sort of from a core point of view and, and you know, all the new sort of innovative stuff um, that, that they, they want to do. And actually in Accenture, we've, we've kind of followed exactly that path because we've been reinventing our own business. You know, we had a very sort of clear business model for, many, you know, for probably the first 20 years of my career in the firm. And now you know, we're facing a lot of the same competitive pressures that a lot of our clients are facing. And that's exactly what we've done. So we've really thought about what's our core business, that's systems integration and IT and BPO. Um, but then what's the new and how do we pivot to that? And that's really Accenture Digital and all the things that we do around some of these new technologies. So I don't know if it does that answer your question a um, bit? Um, yes, well, it's, 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 uh, I suppose it gives an example of the, the best example. I'm, I'm very well aware of Accenture and I've seen articles, uh, you know, um, your sh shining example of what you do. I guess my experience has been of the sort of murkier, grubbier, <laughs> uh, more laggard end of the uh, end of the spectrum. And, uh, and for sure, I mean, yeah. it's not easy. And 
I'd say some of the biggest barriers I see now with the clients I work with is just how you, how you shift the culture of an organisation that is used to doing things in very long investment cycles. You know, you need to kick off a project, it's going to take three years to deliver, we know where we want to get to at the end of it, and shifting that culture to one that's much more you know, innovative, much more prepared to be agile, to pivot as you go, and, and to sort of test and learn, and actually pre prepared to have a few things not go the way you thought they might, and actually, you know, decide, okay, well, that, that was, felt like it was a good idea, it wasn't, we'll bin that one, we'll do something else. You know, that's very difficult for, for organisations that have operated in a particular way for a long time. Yeah, yeah I was having a, a conversation at a non-Manchester event, sorry, um, earlier in the week with a pharmacologist drugs and he was talking about, um, you see, conscious drugs, we're, we're all on the same page now. But he was talking about um, the research that's happening inside the big pharmaceutical companies at the moment where they're trying to find the drug, the next billion dollar drug. And what they did was they looked at how the last billion dollar drug was found. They said, right, if you do that, we're going to upscale it. Because if you've got a team of 20 people that can find a billion dollar drug, if we have a team of 180 people and the processing power in the laboratory, we're going to find one a month, right? And it hasn't happened because that human bit. So now you've got lots of big businesses who've, who have invested, who have you know, genuinely kind of led on this, going, but the technology's not working because we're not using the humans in the right way. And I think my experience of public and private, that's, that's part of that challenge. Um, although I must say, I think the private sector is better at doing things without a focus working group and a plan, and a, they just kind of go, well, we'll do it. But then is that a question? I mean, you're kind of at that moment of scaling. So how are you making the decision about where you drive next? So one example that's happened to us very recently, we do have a plan. We have a 12-month roadmap of our tech development, but uh, opportunities land on your doorstep and you pause it all and you just seize it. So one example that came to us was uh, this uh, the kayak of diamonds, it's called Rare Carrot, and it allows you to search in a very intelligent way for the most competitive diamonds in the market. And we happen to have a connection who said, um, we can get you uh, listed as a vendor there. Uh, all of the other people who are on this platform are huge businesses. We're talking Walmart, we're talking uh, Blue Nile, all the big names. Um, and we were the first people to, uh, we were the fastest people to go from yes to on the platform. And then when Rare Carrot had to change something in their business process, we were the first people to be able to adapt to it. For, so for a window of time, uh, we were uh, some of the only results showing on their, on their site because we were able to pause everything that we were doing and say, this is an opportunity that we can seize today. And the leads come from it. The leads come in, high value customers. Yeah. But that, that's harder with a with a bigger structure. And I think the Home Office is trying to do it at the moment, aren't they? And they said, don't, don't all apply for residence now. And I'm sure part of that is a conversation that's going on where they're saying, well, we haven't got the people and we don't have the processing power. So then they are, it feels to me like they're trying to do what you're doing, which is like hold, mm. hold, and then go. Have you got anything you want to add on that in terms of what well, you're I seeing a question, trend? Actually, I'd like to ask, which is that, can you see inside the diamond on your video? Because... Yeah. yeah, so you, whether they're, is it called inclusions? Inclusions. In, yeah, can you actually sort of if show been. the people yeah. that are buying the diamond? So which all one? of our stones are graded and they have a, GI, a GIA certificate. And on the certificate, there is a map of all the inclusions and it has yeah. a little key describing sort of whether they're visible, whether they're feathers, whether they're just slight clouds. But also then now we're trying to provide videos and images so then you can actually see the diamond that you're going to buy. And obviously people... Uh, fearful of, of buying something and then it arrives in person and yeah, I can tell you a line my wife my wife said to me when I got married and with the, she said first there's the engagement ring this is talking mm -hmm. about me then there was the wedding ring and now there's the suffering <laughs> um, which uh, you might want to use as a strap line <laughs> <laughs> And if anyone else wants to talk about the trends in, in diamonds. Um, no, next question. Uh, there's one, I think, here first, and then we'll come to you. Thank you. Can you hear? Yes. Yes. Uh, John Smith. A um, couple of uh, comments first before I ask the question. First, I'd just like to say to everybody here how sad I was to read in the news today about the fire at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. 
I think it's terrible. We don't know the outcome or the details yet, but I think it's in the research area. And one poor, poor lady who was working there said that all her work has lost. I mean, it's such a fantastic centre, and um, I just want to add my sadness and uh, I hope everything can be put right very quickly. Um, and, and something a bit more positive. Vasilis, um, one thing I do want to say is that I'm delighted that the vinyl uh, records are coming back. <laughs> That's back to well. my era. I, I'm so happy that I can buy vinyl again. Music to my ears as well. Thank you, Vasilis. That's good. <laughs> But no, the other, uh, my, my main question is um, we all can see what's going on and the question at the back there about governance and the legal framework, etc., is very important and I don't think it's caught up yet. But the thing I would want to see from our government to be f forward thinking and the question is, what about this is filtering down into the schools? We have to start getting the young kids thinking for the future, creative thinking, new ideas. Is that being... My daughter's a teacher, she's a maths teacher, but I'm wondering what is coming down to change things to make them think that way? That's an enormous question. And I think it kind of goes to that point about, you know, is it sustainable? Can schools move fast enough? You know, if you are going to say to a school um, of 1,500 secondary school pupils that this is the new bit of technology they need in order to do that, scale that up. That's a, and I, I think that's a real issue kind of around that then sending it out. But if you could go into school, I mean, because you're all recruiting into your businesses as well and looking at it, do you feel like there's a shift happening in the people that are coming, uh, a, a recent product yeah, yeah. of Absolutely. the system? Absolutely. Um, well, I have to go see the millennial video. They went viral, like seven million hits, millennials in the workplace. You know, it's actually the, the conclusion I came to is that that was the, that went viral. And, and for those that didn't see it, it was, it was, about millennials in the workplace and them having a sense of entitlement and, um, and, and, and not being adequately prepared. But I'm not sure it was the schools that were at fault. It was the parents for telling them that they were really good at everything and then they got to work and they found out that they weren't very good at anything. <laughs> so uh, I've been telling my kids since they were seven that I wouldn't turn up for a play in which they were a tree in Sherwood Forest, <laughs> that I actually needed a speaking part out of one of them if I was going to rock up. And, um, you know, the, 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 uh, again, not to be boring, but there's an educational technology briefing that you can subscribe to. You know, today children, you know, younger children, and also I think postgraduate, you know, we're going to Rome. Put your VR goggles on. Go inside the pyramid. You know, go inside Tutankhamun's. Um, I mean, the, the world of education is opening up massively, Um, Pearson, which is a publicly listed uh, educational platform, I remember seeing an article on Mark Zuckerberg's wife giving $50 million dollars to a free school in San Diego for technology and development, and I wrote an alert to our, to our, our clients sort of saying, you better stop, stop, hope that her passion for free education stops here, and it hasn't. Yeah. Um, and if you have a look at Pearson's share price, you'll see that you know, a free education is going to be um, pretty much available to anyone anywhere in the world within a reasonably short period of time. Of course, that's not what we necessarily want from an education. We want, the, we want collegiate, uh, we want an all-round sports, we want team building, we want, you know, we want kids to draw pictures as well as go into the pyramids. And it's really all about... It's all about balance, really, uh, between the digital world and, uh, and the other things. But um, it doesn't frighten me. I mean, we just have to learn to work with these things. So I think that balance is interesting because I've got primary school-aged kids and their friends are divided into the ones where they don't have TVs. You know, they don't do the whole screen thing. Um, and then I'm talking to the parents, but don't do the screen thing. And we're emailing and WhatsApping and talking, and, and it's all happening through the screen. But I think... I think actually the education point, I think you're, probably does come down to, we have a generation of parents who are on the pivot, who've got technology happening at work, technology happening at home, and then the kids on the tablet. I mean, did you all see the stuff about the four-year-old who managed to blow a sizable amount of money on Amazon? Because she crept into the bedroom, got mum's thumb while mum was asleep. <laughs> ding! Ding, ding, ding! That's why I won't have one of those talking, um, you, do you know what I mean? I'd come home and there'd be ponies <laughs> everywhere and actual robots, that would be horrific. <laughs> But I mean, what would, you, what would you do in a school? What would you like to see so happening? So there's been, 
there's been that's again very interesting question, um, and for me the main um, the main conclusion that I've I've uh, managed to get to is the fact that n not enough is happening. And there is a reason that not enough is happening. And kind of, for, in my mind, it links to the previous question that um, why, are we, why is it so difficult to adapt to this kind of change? Why is it so difficult for, um, for the education ministers throughout the years to be able to sign an equivalent of the, an appropriate education program for primary schools? Or for school? The reason, in my mind, is, is us, people. Ultimately, it comes down to how well do we adapt to change in our everyday life. If you are a parent, how easily do you adapt to change? The, the adaptability to change is going to determine how easily you will allow your kid to adapt to change. It's something that we inherit. Um, now, we're thinking about, we're thinking about England, UK. Um, I come from Greece, completely different background, even harder to adapt to change. So think of that as a global impact. I think, I think education is going to be massively affected, as, uh, as Nick mentioned, um, by, by the technology trends. But it's never going to be as influential as it should be if we do not try to adapt to change in a much, much easier and less, um, well, I don't want to use the word dangerous. It sounds, you know, way, way too frightening, but well, less, that, less, less painful way. I mean, yeah. So that's the velocity, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, exactly. We're, that's we're, asking, we're asking ordinary people to understand extraordinary Precisely. things. Precisely. Without, like, without properly explaining them, because that's, yeah. that's the other parameter. So how much does the current officials know about the technology that is influencing our everyday lives to be able to sign an educational program that will transform the lives of children at school? How much confidence do you have in them? You see, that's, these, are, these are the kinds of questions that, that, that trigger to my mind, and there's not, it's not an easy answer. It's always a debate, always, <laughs> every time. But that's, again, that's the purpose of humanity, I guess. One of the students I worked with said the other day, she said, she said, look, you've got to understand, my parents don't get technology. She's like, the only computer my mum's ever used is getting a cash out. You know, that's, that's her interaction with technology. And I'm asking her to Skype me. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Have you got anything that you wanted to... Oh, Ravin? Yeah, just to comment. I'm in the area Continue. of education. And for those of you interested, I think you all need... There's a move... Ravin, if you can catch the mic, then we... <laughs> for our technology audience as well. I had to Google it as well just to make sure I get the acronyms right. But um, there's a move in education to move away from what they call... You'll hear schools talking about moving away from the ice age to the ace age. So for those of you like me, I've got kids, one in primary, one in secondary. But that's what you want to watch out for. Ice age is instruction, comprehension, examination. And that's pretty much what we're all, we've experienced and is the majority of education now. What they're moving towards is ACE age, A-C-E, agility, capability, and empowerment. And it's things like thinking on your feet, being uh, flexible, uh, floundering intelligently. Now, these are things that they're able to teach children really, really well. I'm seeing my, uh, the headmaster at our school is very progressive. I'm seeing my nine-year-old being able to do that, and it's working at school. So, the intentions are there from the question that came up, but you really need the backing of a good headmistress or a headmaster to push it through because the resistance is incredible. The good news is the knowledge is there. So if you're interested, the ACE age, um, it's, it's really uh, heartening to hear that the systems behind the education are already there. So, and for those of you looking for a good place for your kids, that's what you want to watch out for. Very good. Um, I promised a, a question there, so, and then we'll come over to this side. Thank you. Um, my name is Yemi Bosari, and um, I'm in the process of launching a platform which is supposed to be disrupted to a certain industry, hair services. And I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering what challenges I should look out for. The ultimate goal of this platform is to provide, um, promote home services, freelancers in the hair services industry. There's barbers, hairdressers, treatment companies, um, we're looking at being the one-stop shop in the nearest future where you can find all these professionals. And um, we're constantly trying to improve um, based on lessons learned from people like Deliveroo where, you know, they're getting hacked by people 
um, ordering food using other people's cards. And we're learning those lessons. We're trying to implement security systems. Um, we, we, for, for barbers and hairdressers that want to provide home service, we're, we're integrating an API for background checks to make sure there's safety. But I keep, you know, I'm very curious about, you know, I need some advice from you. What, what type of challenges do you think I should look out for since I'm, I'm new and I'm about to get into the space? What challenges do you think I should look out for? Good question. I haven't um, been out on my own for most of my life now. <laughs> um, and, and with my new company, uh, and I think you'll find this really confusing because I found it really confusing, but it was a light bulb moment for me. You used, really interestingly, you used the word service loads and loads of times. And you might think that you're a technology, <laughs> right, when you're actually you're a service. So I was spending millions of dollars of my own money on technology. And everybody that I spoke to said, you know, don't, don't employ human beings, right? They're, they're not viral and you have to look after them and you have to, you know, it's not scalable and, and stuff like that. And, um, and then I sort of realized that we were a service, not a technology. And that was absolutely a breakthrough moment. So um, there are a couple of things that are really tricky as an entrepreneur these days, establishing the business. So when I was a stockbroker, I knew Goldman Sachs were there, Morgan Stanley were there, and Merrill Lynch were there. I knew who they were, what they did, and who my competition was, right? You know, in a digital age, it's quite difficult because you know, it could be a kid in California establishing a business. So it's very difficult to map your, your, your competition out. But to what extent you can in your market, do. <laughs> do as much research as you possibly can on it. Look at their strategies. Look at what, what successes or failures they've had and try and learn from uh, your competitive landscape. And then just be super passionate about every customer that you have because you are a service. If, you're, you, know, if you look after people really, really well, they'll come back. <laughs> There's a two stuff. I'm sure that other people have got other, yeah, no, other I stuff mean, I to was say. I say something similar, which is just this relentless focus on the customer experience and making it as frictionless and seamless and, and as good as possible and continuing to get feedback from your customers and then continuing to improve the service based on the feedback that you get from customers. Um, thinking about how you stay differentiated, you know, what's going to keep the competition out? Um, you know, if it's really successful, there'll be others who try and replicate the same model you have. So, yeah, how would you, how would you continue to compete and differentiate? Um, and then security is an obvious one. I mean, just, you know, people are so are getting increasingly private about their data and increasingly concerned, I think, about, you know, data breaches and, and losing their personal data. So, you know, absolute focus on, on security and keeping it secure. Yeah, when you're sending strange people with knives and acid into other people's <laughs> houses. <laughs> Good luck with your business. You. Um, <laughs> do you want to add? Uh, yeah, from, from my perspective, keep evolving, right? Never stay static, because the biggest enemy of your evolution is your, is your own platform, yourself effectively, and what you think about it. Whatever you think about it, it can become, if you do it gradually, and if you are paying attention to exactly all those challenges that um, Arabel mentioned. Um, Attention to customer experience, obviously, but you know, in a gradual manner, is important. So one of the things we've uh, implemented is, because um, obviously we're a service business as well, it's a remuneration that's tied back to um, the level of service that a, 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 a consultant has managed to deliver to their customers. So we track something called NPS score, Net Promoter Score. Um, so this is a, a measure uh, between 0 and 10, basically anything above uh, an eight uh, is a positive, anything uh, below a six is a negative. And uh, we basically have a rolling 30, 90 day target for each of our consultants and we're using that um, as both a, a measure to understand what's successful in terms of customer, um, customer experience but also then as a motivator by being able to track, um, uh, track and uh, remunerate uh, based on service. Um, we can, you can also use it to uh, different points in the customer cycle to get an understanding of how people are then, um, uh, how their experience is evolving over extended periods of time. So it took us a while to set up, but it's been invaluable uh, in aligning our consultants' objectives with our customers' objectives. Yeah. Can I just pick up on one point there? That yeah, and then we'll... I'm oh, sorry, we'll just about the level of service. The thing that really gets me mad is whether I buy a rail ticket, whether I buy it from Amazon, whether I go to the bank. Could you rate our services today? Could you do this? I just delete them. I'm just fed up. The only time I will go back to this is if something goes wrong. But rate it one to five. I bought a rail ticket. 
Leeds last weekend. How was our service? How was this? How was this? It'll only take five minutes. I'm not interested. You see, I'm, I'm not a big Twitter. If I've got a complaint, then I will use Twitter because that's how they talk to me. Um, so if we can have a, a, a gentle lob of the microphone. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, my name is Tony Shoes. Uh, I'd like to have a follow-up question as this gentleman had. So we probably, I'm having a very similar situation as you. I'm doing a similar business in a different industry, I'll say. So, and as an international student myself, and, and relatively fresh graduate, graduate in a, uh, two years ago, literally had like two choices, you know, at this age, you, you either uh, find a job or you create jobs. And for me, as an international student, I have two other options, like find a job here or uh, find a job back home or create a job here. And so that metric brought me like four options. And if you want me to rank the difficulties from one to four, probably creating jobs here would be the most difficult one. But unfortunately, I was on that path. And um, so... <laughs> It was really tough, but it's getting better now, so it's been a while, so we can, we can chat later. Um, my, my main question is not about doing the business, actually. It's about the entrepreneur. Uh, we, obviously, we can't talk about digital without talking about the uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurships. And um, so, so I'm, my business is doing okay right now, but it's not totally safe, so I still have to think about, like, uh, what's going my career path going to be like after this business if it fails? So my personal point is, the company does fail, but people don't. I'd like to hear the uh, voices from the industry side. Like if um, someone with previous entrepreneur uh, experience uh, is looking for a job in your company, what's your <laughs> point of view? Like, do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So if, if, you've, if you've done it yourself, can you do it elsewhere? Yes. Yeah. No. I mean, I can certainly answer that. From that perspective because I've you know yeah. the advantage of having been in one company um, for the length of time that I've been there is I've seen the huge change in terms of the types of people that we now recruit and you know and also actually our partner landscape and the ecosystem that we operate in it used to be really simple it was SAP Oracle Microsoft you know those are the only people we yeah. needed to deal with now you know our partner landscape is huge um, we invest a lot of time actually in the startup ecosystem because you know you never know where the next great idea is going to come from, um, and so certainly you know we're we're interested in people that come from all sorts of backgrounds and yeah I mean we have people leave us to go and join startups we have people come from startups to come and join us and everybody brings something in terms of their experience so yeah you know we're we're sort of very open to that because it's just very sort of on trend you know the experience that they bring around you know being able to innovate being able to think in a different way you know it's what I was talking about with the question over here just about you know changing our clients cultures Actually, that's kind of thinking that our clients want. So, yeah, we're very open to that. Yeah, so you know, I actually had a concern about... So being an entrepreneur actually pushes you to become sort of a jack of all trades things. You literally have to do works from your accountant to web developer to designer, everything. So, but I actually found a lot of industry they're looking for experts, kind of people. And, yeah, that's something we're me about. And, but I, I think, yeah, consultancy is something, yeah... Right. Thanks very much. And yeah. Yeah. Sorry, anyone can do. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> good point. Um, if we can go to you and then come down to the front. Um, hi there. Um, so, with the likes of uh, Google, Amazon, and Facebook uh, around the huge amount of intellectual capital that they have, uh, then the huge amount of uh, financial capital they have, um, and their ability to cannibalize smaller uh, startups and the like. Um, would you be able to just reflect a little on your views on the monopolization um, of, of the world, sort of based on this, this digital era that we're in? Um, and then if that's a short uh, question uh, to answer, mm -hmm. Nick, I'd happily hear about the bicycles. <laughs> that was going to be my line. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, what, what you're talking about is what we call whales and plankton. And you're either a whale or you're plankton. And um, it, it's kind of interesting because I think we were talking about it earlier. With, we, with WeChat is Facebook, PayPal, Amazon in one super app. 
which I, I don't know whether it could happen from a regulatory standpoint, but from the Chinese government's point of view, say 150 million people, they can monitor everything in one place. Um, so there's kind of a human rights wrapper around, around we, <laughs> we, WeChat. Um, but it, but it, you know, again, the perception is is that the, the West is leading, and the reality is is that China's uh, crushing us in almost every field that we that we look at. Um, the velocity of the so, you know, I was, I was kind of super interested in what you were saying in terms of you know, concentrate on your core business. And what was rushing through my head is like, what do you say to VW, right, who's trying to get out of their legacy business into uh, uh, electric cars? Um, and there are 200 electric car companies in, in China, um, 200. Um, and I've seen estimates, public estimates, for a 50% market share. So their financing business, the value of their second-hand um, cars are depreciating uh, ra rapidly. And to turn around and say, focus on your core, there's, there's one of two strategies. It's like get out, like Fiat Chrysler. And also you've got to spend billions competing against Apple and Facebook, <laughs> a Waymo, Al you know, Alphabet, et cetera. So you've got to deal with the software side of it, which costs billions, and you've got to deal with the electric vehicle side of it, which costs billions, and you've got to have a bit of a bet on hydrogen or, or a couple of other technologies. And, and the reality of it is I think that they, uh, quite a few of them are just going to go bust. Uh, I don't think there is a huge amount that they can do about it because of these, because of these, super, these super trends. And, um, and super trends are really sort of super interesting because <laughs> they're, they're kind of... Again, I think the example I use is a show of hands, you know, 10 years ago, who thought there could be another coffee shop, right? <laughs> I mean, I know, I know that I was walking around saying, we can't do another coffee shop. You know, Starbucks is an $80 billion market capitalization company, and, and the super trend is not coffee. The super trend is, is, is mobility and co-working. So you pay coffee, you buy coffee as a rent to sit down and work. And the reason that I love bicycles and e-bikes especially, so if you think of an, uh, of an Asian city like, uh, you know, you know well, city of Vietnam, or you think of some of the Asian cities and you see the number of mopeds, they kind of outnumber cars 10, 15 to 1. So there's this huge bias in this debate created by, so I should stand up, there's a huge bias in this debate created by a gentleman called Elon Musk, who's convinced the whole world that he's going to take ever, everything, go to outer space, and um, you know, nobody's really noticed that hydrogen stocks have gone up 50% in the last three months, and they're actually sort of starting to do really, really well. And, um, and, and so if I look at something like bicycles, which again, feels to me like coffee did 10 years ago, and I look at the super trends that are basically in place, there are two reasons why people don't reasons why people don't cycle in urban areas is one, they don't want to get hit by a car, which is fatalities, and the other one is pollution. <laughs> yeah? Well, all the new autonomous cars have 3,000 sensors around them, right? so the traffic fatalities are going to start to disappear if you believe in the autonomous technology, and they're all going to be electric. So the pollution <laughs> is gone, and the, you know, and the, um, the chances of getting hit will be narrowed very dramatically. So that super trend with bikes is in place. Now you start to say, well, they're easy to store, they're easy to share, right? You can't hack or weaponize them. They're better for your health. They don't break down because you just pedal. The new electric bikes do 80 kilometers per hour, uh, sorry, 80 kilometers on one charge, and they can go between 15 and 30 miles an hour in a city where the average speed of, of traffic has dropped from 14.8 to 7.8 miles an hour. So I will be you know, potentially going from Fulham Broadway to Canary Wharf, which is unthinkable, on a bicycle uh, in five or ten years' time. So then I start to think about which companies I might want to invest in around that, and all of a sudden Halford's bikes becomes pretty interesting. And then I look at another trend, and I say, actually, they don't even need a retail shop to sell these things. They should just do pop-up electric bikes and turn up in the middle of Bishopsgate. And then I can start to get quite excited about, about an investment theme around something as potentially dull as bicycles, but the, the, the you know, and again, with, with, with something like BP, they're interested because we actually think there could be so many bikes, it could affect peak oil demand because actually there'll be more bikes than cars. <laughs> That's why I wanted to talk about bikes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably enough for everyone. So I'll sit down. <laughs> yeah. um, I think there's an, interesting, there's an interesting thing there. This fight is always going to be there. No matter what you do, small comp big companies are going to requ acquire smaller ones. It's going to be the trends and all of that. It's always going to happen. There's two key issues here. One is innovation. Human mind is never going to fail you. 
Yeah, you're always going to have the brand new idea to set up your new startup. It's going to grow to be good enough for yourself to sell it to Google. And then you go off and become a billionaire. <laughs> and you go off to Bahamas or something like that and you stay there for the rest of your life. You, you know, this is always going to happen. Yeah, sure. That, that's nice. So it was just more the reflection on are we at an unprecedented level of monopolization? Is it really, though? I don't know. I, just your reflections, yeah, really. That, that's, it, it was always happening like that. Maybe in a much smaller, more, smaller case in the previous uh, decades or so, because you know, media was smaller, communication was in a different kind of format. You didn't know about all these things unless you really, really wanted to look for them. But I don't really believe it's going to be on a ratio. It hasn't been any different to what's been in the past. The only thing that has happened is that we've been more innovative. We've been evolving as human beings, and we've been creating many, many more absolutely brilliant ideas, and we've been making money out of them. Um, I promise to come here. I want to be on the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Um, we have a regular guest at these events, which are guide dogs in training. So please don't, after you get out of here, all practice playing fetch with the dog, because it's not fair. <laughs> so um, I'm concerned about the paradox that all this digital business has generated a lot of very low-grade jobs, which are mainly around delivery and um, working in horrible warehouses. I mean, there's been a lot of um, uh, talk about Amazon's working conditions. And a lot of people who've had their jobs sort of Uberized, they've got very few rights. Uh, so the question is, is this a temporary phenomenon, or is this something we need to be worried about? I, I think, given what you were saying earlier... I mean, well, I don't know. Should we look at it from a kind of a, an entrepreneur's perspective and then sure. perhaps from a scale perspective? So we've, uh, all the positions that we've been filling uh, recently have uh, been in uh, sales and development. So obviously development, we all know what that is. But the sales role in, in a business like ours is, is quite different. It's not just about uh, customer service. The, the persona that we've identified that works well in our, our business is this kind of... Uh, as the guy was describing at the back earlier, a jack of all trades, getting people who are willing to sort of get their hands dirty in, in everything um, and who are willing to use technology and expert systems to, uh, as long as they're a competent professional, to seem like a, an expert. So I, I feel like we're getting into a position where as long as you're... As long as you're you have a work ethic, you can build systems around a person to enable them to do far more or, or a far broader range of tasks than they, you previously might have expected of a person. So I think we might see people instead migrating into jobs that they might not have ever imagined they could have previously been able to achieve. Yeah. I, I, I think we should be super concerned, and, and I'll just give you one statistic because it's already happening. Uh, Donald Trump Brexit, right? The super cycle is the def deflationary impact of technology on, on, on average earnings, which is the average Brit hasn't had a pay rise. Right? 80% of Brits haven't had a pay rise for 12 years. 97% of Italians haven't had a pay rise for 12 years. And 80% of Americans haven't had a pay rise for 12 years. So when you look at the, you know, the politics of what's happening and then you look at the super trend or the super cycle, it's the deflationary impact of technology, which is, you know, Brexit and, and Trump aren't in any way, shape, or, or form related to politically to what, you know, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in North America. But that statistic was brought out by BlackRock, and it's one that resonated with me, and I think we're already paying the price for, uh, for deflation. And, and, and that's really the issue rather than the actual job itself, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You got it? Well, yeah. I guess a couple of comments. You know, I think there have always been low-grade jobs. It's just those jobs are changing um, as a result of some of these new digital businesses. So it's actually, I mean, it's created jobs. They might not be, you know, they might be low-grade, but, you know, it is actually job creation. So I guess that's... I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I guess that's one element of it. I mean, the other is, you know, we're creating new jobs all the time, you know. So as we look at jobs that are being replaced by technology, equally a whole new set of jobs are being created that actually we can't even predict yet. So, you know, I, I think about this a lot. I've got a nine-year-old and six-year-old twin, so I sort of think about, you know, what are the jobs that they're going to have? And actually that point about education is really front of mind for me because I actually don't know what to encourage them to learn about at school because I just can't even predict, you know, 15, 20 years ahead, what are the jobs that they're going to be trying to prepare for? So, so, I mean, I think it is concerning. I think it is something to watch. But I also think it's fascinating because, you know, well, it, I mean, it's, it's just that level of change again, but, it, but in the job market. So. And I think there was a previous discussion um, at one of these events when we were talking about future talent and kind of industry and universities and how it all comes together. And there was a statistic from one of our speakers that the average tenure of a CEO has dropped from seven to three years. So people are changing jobs more frequently uh, than they ever have, and that will have an impact then on the spaces and how you build. And that then goes to the question about entrepreneurs and where people fit. I, I mean, what I do didn't exist when I graduated. The technology that my husband works with didn't exist when he graduated. I have zero expectation that I will understand what my children do. Like, I mean, well, Minecraft's happened in my house, so I'm, you know, fundamentally, I'm lost. I, but I'm comfortable. But that's then the change thing, yeah. Because I'm comfortable with that. But I, but I sort of, you know, again. Sorry, I'm probably talking too much. But I've lots of headmasters, right? Great headmaster speech. We're trying to change, you know, trying to tra train our children for jobs that don't exist yet in industries that haven't been invented, right? And I kind of don't agree. Right? I really don't. If you look closely enough, I mean, obviously there's an element of, of things that you can't predict. But uh, you stood up earlier and you said, like, these companies are gathering these millions of bits of data and they really don't know what to do with it. Well, I'm pretty sure that data audit is going to be one of the biggest businesses in the world and that fake news is a big issue. Yeah? And I know that Moat was sold for $50 million and it specializes in making sure that data metrics are, you know, you can collect data and you can say almost anything you want and there's no auditing of that data. I think it's going to be a massive business. I'm pretty sure bicycles going to be quite big. I'm pretty, sure if I, uh, pretty sure if I swapped, you know, my, my kids have come out of an English public school. They can't, they've been, they can't code. Now, if they swap Latin for, for coding as one language for another, I think they've got a greater probability, possibility. I'm not suggesting that there aren't all sorts of you know, again, balance is absolutely key in everything that we say and everything we address. But I do sort of have a really good idea. You know, sales, <laughs> I think it's going to be around for a long time. People that love people, that, 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 you know, that, that enjoy human companionship. Um, we, need two million, we need two million jobs in uh, social care today in this country to look after mental illness and, and those are affected. So... I, I, I sort of, I, I get why it's a great speech, but I sort of only partially agree with it. I, I do understand what's being said there. Yeah. I think it's that flexibility, isn't it? It's feeling, are you in touch enough with what's going on that you can feel flexible enough to bend it? Because I think that's one of the things that's really struck me about kind of what, what you're both talking about with your landscape is that you're, you're comfortable having to respond very fast to new things, so then that change, as you were saying, doesn't, doesn't frighten you. No, and it, and it shouldn't, I believe. Of course there is an issue, yeah, I'm not, I'm not disputing the, the concern at all. It's a combination of, it's a combination of knowledge and, ed and education, as well as adaptability and fear of the new, fear of the um, unknown, let's say. I mean, again, show of hands, how many of you ever found yourselves in a job of completely unknown uh, territory. Nobody. Just, just for the oh, face. Sorry, for I didn't understand the question. Yeah, a, a job with, that you've ever had to go in and do where you really haven't known anything that was involved in that job or that you needed to do yeah. in that job. And that, and that shows you that there is a level of comfort in what we want to do. We, we rarely, I mean, re not rarely though, that's, a, that's again the wrong word, but we don't really easily get out of our comfort zone to do something, which is something, by the way, that if you're an entrepreneur and you try to apply for a job, is something that is really remarkable. It shows that you've tried to do something 
try to, to make an effort for something new or something innovative, which shows what kind of person you are. And on that side, you shouldn't worry. You won't worry too much about your future because you find yourself really adaptable to any kind of situation you are in. Intelligent floundering. Is, is it reasonable though <laughs> to expect that the, uh, a large proportion of society that were already in sort of low-paid, low-skilled jobs should be more capable than, and more flexible than everyone who's currently in this room? Is that a reasonable expectation that we can have of a future generation, that we can expect the full spectrum of people to be this super flexible worker who can, Certainly can adapt? Certainly not the full spectrum. Absolutely not. Even 10%? Because it's not... Maybe, maybe not even that. Mm. I was just thinking that your kids and they wouldn't even need to code in the future when they come mm -hmm. out of school. They wouldn't even need to learn how to program. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, but, but then they don't, know, they don't need to know Latin. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> and that doesn't really help them very much either because they don't want to be doctors. And I would, I would say to the, the kids that were asking, you know, the young gentleman, excuse my stupid phrase, but one of the things that freaks me out is that no one really serves an apprenticeship anymore. Mm. I don't even, you know, the, by the way, the other word for entrepreneur is incapable of taking instruction, <laughs> right? And, and um, ba basically, you know, no one will ever offer you a job, so you have to become one. Um, it, it kind of chooses you. You don't choose, you don't choose it because you don't work well in structured, particularly in, in, in structured environments, you know? Um, but, but kind of what freaks me out about the sort of three or four jobs is that, you know, I did a job until I was 32, 3, 4. So I did it for 15 years before I went out on my own. And I had a foundation of relationships. I had a roller deck and I had a core competence in something. I mean, I go into WeWork now and I just freak out. It's like, uh, you know, people having okra sandwiches and, and mint tea. And they're all like, you know, all the same age group. And there's no one there with any grey hairs. And, and, you know, maybe KPMJ have injected themselves because they want to catch the next idea. And the reality of it is that 99% of these businesses are going to fail because that's what the failure rate is. And they don't have an apprenticeship. And it's the greed of our generation chasing the next Mark Zuckerberg. You know, one 25-year-old made 50 billion, right? That does not give a generation of 25-year-olds of, of a license to go out and, and, um, and um, you know, start their own business because it's a really super difficult thing to do. It is so tough. You know, I've, I've spent four years building curation and we've just got to break even. We make 50 grand a year now and that's taken four years now i'm super bullish on its on its but i don't know and i've made and just when i think i can't possibly make another mistake i find another one to make <laughs> you know and i and 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 it's very humbling and it's very difficult and i wish more young people would serve an apprenticeship stick with something because it doesn't mean that that's the job you've got to do for the rest of your life you see tangential opportunities the entire time you may be a lawyer you may study the law but then one client comes in one day you develop a relationship with him and you go and do something completely different and i wish we could uh, communicate that to our, to our people uh, younger folk because i do believe that whatever they decide to go on to do and i don't want to pigeonhole anybody that just knowing something about something before you decide to do it is gently helpful. Well, then a friend and I were talking about this, uh, particularly as women in business or women in anything, there is this idea that if you're not where you want to be at 45, that's it, it's game over. And then she went, well, Theresa May didn't get the home office until she was 50, and she didn't get the PM until she was 60, so perhaps everybody needs to stretch their their horizons a bit and I think that's the other thing you know you're you're talking about the beer moth and the you know is it all just coming together in one hand it is but it's a set of hands that's changing and it's a set of hands that's that's shaping and I think I spend a lot of time talking with young people about what you're saying you know don't worry about having a career just worry about what you're going to do next whether it's not croissant sandwich and mint tea or you know climbing into your suit and strapping on your tie and getting a proper job um, I can say that I graduated straight into a startup, so I've done it the other way around. <laughs> um, now, um, we are starting to run a bit tight on time, but I can see four hands up. So if nobody is desperate for a break, I propose that we take some quick questions and points. Have you got one that's come in from... Who do I throw it to? Friends. So straight to Marcus, and then we'll come over to you and then to you. Okay, so first point is um, this is... a 
comment. These are two comments from uh, the Facebook Live. Thanks, everyone, who's watching, and apologies for any disruption in uh, uh, quality earlier. Uh, but Benjamin would like the chair to know that Benjamin is watching. Um, oh, hello, so. Benjamin. Okay. <laughs> Ask him if he's got his shorts on or whether he's just wearing the gold lame jacket. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and if nobody, if you don't all go away and watch the film now, I've said that. Okay, that went in a weird direction. Um, <laughs> uh, the next question is from... Uh, I Car can't help it, I was born disrupting. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Carlos Salinas <laughs> from uh, Nicaragua, uh, so thanks for tuning in from uh, Central America, would like to ask, in the context of e-commerce, do you have any comments or advice regarding virtual offices providing legal services? And that's to, that's to the panel in general. Virtual offices providing legal services. Uh, well, I, 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 uh. unfortunately, we can't go back to the question to ask for a clarification. Well, no, I'm just wondering whether that's about sort of outsourced legal provision. You know, do you do you need to be a lawyer operating in a territory to be able to give advice on that territory, perhaps? Or is it about have you found co-working spaces that have, for example, an in-house lawyer? Well, I mean, the one that we're currently in, uh, bathtub de pod room, um, when you generally enter these co-working spaces, obviously there's a fantastic network of experience behind them. Um, our one in particular has a huge panel of mentors um, across the full spectrum of business. So they've been massively helpful in uh, helping us with all of our corporate governance and legal needs. Um, I'm not yeah. sure if that helps. That networking. I mean, are you kind of doing anything with, with your business process outsourcing? Does that cross over into the legal space or not so much yet? Not so much yet. Yeah. I think it's probably coming. Um, can we bounce over? I, I made a promise to, to that row, but if we can go to the gentleman in the end and then to you and then to you to finish. Before I do, I'll, sorry, is this on? Yeah. Before I do, I'll just mention that Benjamin has posted a link to a Dolce Gabbana Paisley embossed blazer. Um, so anyone who's interested in that can visit our Artificial intelligence, Facebook page. it goes in a really weird direction. Hiya. So, I mean, just following on from the point, and it's something that I've been viewing. So this is my first event, didn't know what to expect, and really been pleasantly impressed, so thank you. But going back to it, by its very nature, disruption isn't linear. You can't model it, it's difficult to model. But you've got a number of experts out there, and I'm... Um, you know, reading a lot around this space. Going back to the failure rate, people are just going out there, setting themselves up as experts, then suddenly creating a career out of it. Am I right in saying that a lot of it is just nonsense? And I've got a lot stronger words for it, but, you know, we're polite society and, you know, yeah. we're not the poly, right? Do you want me to answer? Anyone, really, but... I think, I mean, I think there, there, are a, there are a bunch of futurists that, that are, are earning a living by, by talking crazy stuff and yeah. as I said I try to use the word balance as many times as I possibly could I mean we do what, what, what we do is we accept that these things are really super difficult that yeah. velocity is a super difficult thing to, to measure but we just did a piece of work with McKinsey where they did like a battery cost curve analysis and then so it might be a bit boring but technical uh -huh. but but actually what it is is that to have any chance of, of, of following these trends you have to measure them almost every day so there are outrageous things. But batteries is like, is like if it, it's like the Wild West. If, if pharmaceutical companies behave like battery companies did, right? You know, you could, oh, you could charge this battery in three seconds. You can, but you can never use it again, yeah. right? Um, yeah, it's like a bath, the battery. You can fill it up with a, with a fire hose in a second, and you could dump a skip of water on top of it, and you could fill it up very quickly. You know, lithium-ion technology hasn't changed for 10 years and these sorts of things. So we built a battery cost curve analysis with McKinsey, and we found out things that 50% uh, that, that of the world's cobalt supplies in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And therefore, we write an algorithm to, to monitor the DRC. And actually, the biggest risk isn't war of the DRC. It's EU supply chain regulations on, on environment, social responsibility, and corporate governance. So we write an algorithm to follow that. And so I, I think there's a lot of crap talks about it, can, candidly. But what we try to do is pr bring a real process to that um, so that we, we know that people are for, you know, the good... The secret to good forecasting is to do it regularly, is, is the same. We don't really believe in that. We believe in constantly monitoring it on an ongoing basis. 
so that um, so that it isn't crap because yeah. actually we know these are super difficult things to predict and they can take off at any stage but unless you're looking at it every day right um, which most people can't do so what we try to do is embrace the principles of the on-demand economy the sharing economy and the um, uh, and club membership so club membership's Amazon to go back to your question you know on-demand is Uber and, and Airbnb is, is sort of sharing or stuff like that so if the project costs 200,000 pounds for you know you can't normally afford it if we find 10 people <laughs> to share that project it's 20 grand and um, uh, so we're making what I don't believe in that I'm cleverer than anybody else I just believe in forensic monitoring and it's developing into a full-time profession and most corporates haven't realized that yet because they haven't invented a budget to pay for it does that, does that sort yeah, of answer well, it? I mean, one of the things that I've also experienced going on to your cultural shift thing, so I've worked for the best part of 20-odd years now, um, and I'd say a lot of IT directors, finance directors, CEOs are committed to what they've invested in the past from a reputational point of view. So, for example, <laughs> I've championed this product. They're not, from a political career point of view, going to backpedal, and it might be related to the tenure point that, you know what, every CEO... Yeah changes every three years, but then you know, the reason he might have changed is because he's just screwed up three years ago when he's invested or executed the wrong system. Yeah. Yeah. And execution is a word that we haven't discussed yet because I see a lot of great ideas in the past, but just the ability to implement a plan, just, um, you know, I've seen it go very wrong. And that might be due to changing landsca and landscapes, but that's, that's a constant as well. But the second bit is people, which is the bit that we always talked about. And, you know, for me, another big thing about technology, which perhaps somebody else will touch on, maybe it's future things and negative things about it, information overload. Do you know, how do you keep up with it? You know, my wife's working at 7.30 at night. You know, that's difficult. I've got something called text neck now where I've got to go and see a chiropractor because I'm doing that. <laughs> like, it's a serious condition, honestly. Uh, £1,500 I've got to pay to correct it, but, you know. Um, you know, I wonder, you know. I wonder if you've been seen by a futurist there. Yeah, um, perhaps yes, just yeah. sort of in the interest of time, if we can take the yeah, next... Unless there's anybody desperate to jump in. No, OK. Hi, I'm Laura. Um, something that really resonated earlier was, Nick, when you mentioned that service is really key to success. Um, we're in an on-demand um, startup, actually focused on massage. Maybe could help you on that. Network lives. And um, something that is really on my mind at the moment is that, as a business, we're obviously keen to embrace some of the trends that have been spoken about today but they may not always be necessarily in the best interests of our customers. So with artificial intelligence as an example, yes, they can come on our website and speak to a robot, but actually they'd probably rather pick up the phone and speak to a person. Just as much as, you know, if I go to the supermarket, I can go to self-service checkout, but actually I'd rather not do it myself. I can't be bothered. And then further to that, our business is so heavily focused on technology and particularly our platforms and, and apps that actually we may be unintentionally alienating some of our potential customer base. So, I mean, how do you embrace these trends but not do so to a negative impact for some of your customers, in your view? I think it's partly about choice, actually. And I think, you know, we're definitely seeing a trend where, you know, the human element of the customer service is an important part of the full sort of end-to-end -end experience. And so actually having that choice, because some people will really embrace a purely digital journey where they don't have to speak to anyone and they can just get what they want without having to actually have any sort of human interaction. And some people don't. And actually being able to offer that choice and being able to sort of seamlessly move from, you know, something that's purely powered by technology to something that has a human element to it as well is actually pretty important if you want to make sure that you know, you're very inclusive in terms of your total customer base. Um, which I think was what you were, were saying, wasn't it? You kind of gone from technology to people to people to technology. and To a hybrid. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's basically trying to find all of the channels that work for your customers. So um, obviously it starts out just as email for us, and now it's, uh, we have uh, chat on the e-commerce site, we have Skype, we have WhatsApp, we have... Like finding every possible way that you can draw a line between you and the customer in every kind of iteration that uh, they might want. So some people just don't actually want to be communicated with at all. Other people like to be able to get a, someone to jump in and give some them some expert advice. It's, 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 it's trying to cover all of your bases. And I, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to find which 
channels have the volume, but I guess it's being um, agile enough to realize that there's a demand there and just implement a solution straight away. Yeah. Um, and I think our last question here. Very good. Hi, my name's Jahansev. And um, first of all, thank you very much for such a diverse panel. I think it's very good to hear such conflicting views sometimes. Interesting. Um, so my question is regarding um, what markets do you think have not been disrupted until now? Especially one of the markets I have in mind, the one I'm related to, is the shipping and freight market in containerized cargo. So at the moment you have, just explaining quickly, so you have different people in, in that market and you have to go and get a rate for that. But the customer never sees the individual segments of the rate. So when do you, th what, what trends are you seeing in that market generally? Do you think there is any advancement on that end or is that some competition coming in the future? That's what I, I want to know. I have a huge amount of experience in the <laughs> shipping freight market. I have to say, I'm not sure I can comment. Well, I, I would say, the, what, one thing I wouldn't forget about is everybody talks about electrification of cars, right? They forget about boats, okay? <laughs> Sorry? Do you think it's possible with the vessels? The yeah, they run on vehicle? diesel. Yeah, diesel's bad. So, you know, you look at the, people constantly look at the uh, adoption of um, EVs and electric, but actually they need to look at, to measure velocity, you need to look at the demise of diesel. So I think there's 16 or 17 cities in, the, in, in Europe looking to ban diesel cars from city centers because of nitrous oxide. So you've kind of got a choice for the car industry to be poisoning you with nitrous oxide or carbon, right? And that's going to apply to boats. And again, this is one of the things I look at, so I'm not pretending to be an expert on ships, but, but one of the things is if you have, take a look at the share prices of Avis and Hertz, yeah, and, and, now, and now look at second-hand car values in the States because of car sharing, and because what's going to happen when they start to ban your diesel car from central London to second-hand car prices of diesel cars, and then what's going to happen to the financing. So these ships are going to go for scrap because they're going to become redundant. They might actually almost, almost be trading there already, which is kind of an interesting thing. So you have to upgrade your fleet. So with someone like Hertz and Avis, they have, one point, they have 13 billion of... Um, $13 billion worth of second-hand cars. And now if they have to depreciate those cars by 10% more than they think, it's $1.3 billion that wipes out their profits. So Merck, Merck have been restructuring in, 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 in recent years and trying to take capacity out of the market. I know that. But the only trend I've really seen in ships is that people forget to talk about electrical, electrification and, and the residual value of the fleet and the new boats because the regulations can change for boats in the same way that they can change for cars. So I don't know too much about the actual pricing of the market and the pricing of the ships based on supply and demand. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be buying a new one. Put it that way. I think we're going to replace all those ships with bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that brings us to a beautiful, a beautiful moment. An evening where we have talked about diamonds, technology, music, scale, trends, gold lame jackets and David Hasselhoff. Thank you. But I think tonight has really shown as well the kind of the breadth and the depth of the alumni network. And that's why these events work. And it's your commentary and it's our panel that have, has made this into what I think has been an interesting uh, set of discussions. Um, now, the next one is uh, 21st Century Leadership, which is going to be on Tuesday, the 20th of June. Um, I am not chairing that one. Um, I am handing over to Lem Sisse, our rather fabulous Chancellor, who's going to be here chairing that one. So that will be hang on to your seats. Um, and off we go. It's going to be absolutely fascinating. Um, I think there is also um, a moment to ask you to do an evaluation form. So sorry, we are asking for feedback <laughs> this evening. Um, and also to update your details at your.manchester.ac.uk. Um, and there's uh, various things happening on there, which I'm not going to go into now, but they are lovely and they're technology being used in a really nice way to enable you to interact with the past as well as in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to our panel. Um, and, yeah, enjoy a drink and a canopy on us. <laughs>